technology. My name is David Chinnery. I work for Cooperative Extension in Rensselaer County. And when I was driving over here, I thought, who would come to this tonight? If I was off, I would be outside. So I appreciate you all coming. Uh, thank you all. We're going to talk about lawns and lawn care and uh, maybe answer some of your questions. And uh, this can get a little long, so I'm going to try to go quickly through this because I could talk about horticulture things for hours. And, you know, I think this is supposed to end by 8 o'clock, so we will move it along. But thank you all for coming. Um, this is my contact information. I don't work technically for Schenectady County, but if you want to send me an email or call me, that would be okay. We're in Troy, and that should have a 518 before the 272, of course. But my email is dhc3 at cornell.edu. If anybody has any questions, I know we probably won't cover everything tonight because there's a lot to know and a lot to talk about. But if you do have questions, we can stay later and we can always uh, answer questions by email and so forth. So that's good. Okay, so one thing I want to just talk about a little bit in the beginning is if I say the word turf grass, that means lawn. Okay, I did this lecture many years ago. And a woman, I went through this whole thing and talked about turf grass, turf grass, turf grass for an hour. And then a woman in the front raised her hand and said, what exactly is turf grass? <laughs> so when I talk about turf grass, that's a fancy word tonight for lawn. So we have lawns in lots of different places, homes, sports fields, although there's alternatives now to those. And this is a picture of Longwood Gardens with a lawn. So a lot of people like a nice green lawn that offsets their landscape and makes things look nice and uh, attractive. Um, I always like to think, uh, or I like to get you thinking about what your goals are. Maybe there's a sp specific weed you'd like to have less of. Maybe you want to have more grass in certain areas. Maybe you're battling grubs or chinch bugs. So those are kind of some of the things that people bring to us uh, questions about. So think about that. And of course, turf grass quality. This is a not the greatest picture here, but the point here is that people like to see that dark green even color. And we have splotches, sometimes that's not attractive, weeds, other grasses in the lawn, things like that. This is a case where people really like to have just one dark green color, okay? And of course, density is one of the things I worry more about than the color. Density does what? If we have a very dense lawn, what does it do for us? Crowds out the weeds. Okay, so if you want to have less weeds, have more grass. Okay, and I'll talk about ways to do that. And we're going to talk about lots of different alternatives and ways to do different things. There's not just one way to do things, but often there's more uh, choices out there. I like to think about doing a site evaluation, and maybe you've done this on your lawn or your, your garden. Think about how much you use the site. Do you have sun or shade, the soil type you have, if you have irrigation or not. How much maintenance do you want to put into it? I know some of you folks like to go out there and work on the lawn every day that you have, right? You're lawn aficionados. You're really into this thing. Other people, you know, if they just mow it and it's green, they're okay with that. So there's all different levels to this sort of a thing. And that goes into quality expectations as well. How much do you really uh, expect out of your lawn? And do you have to have a perfect lawn everywhere? I know some places it's kind of expected that you have a nice lawn. Niskayuna may be a place like that. I'm from Skodak now. Is anybody here from Skodak? Okay, I can say this. Although I know it's on TV, I'm going to kind of tone it down a little bit tonight because we're <laughs> on television. But in Skodak, if you don't have a couple junk cars on your lawn, you're doing pretty good. Okay, so we're, you know, not quite, maybe quite up to the Niskayuna standards here. Okay, so one of the things you might work on uh, with your lawn is to go out and measure your lawn and see how many thousand square feet you have. And why would I be concerned about that? Exactly. If you're going to buy lime, if you're going to buy some kind of grub control or fertilizer or grass seed, you're going to want to know how many thousand square feet you have because a lot of those things are applied in uh, increments of a thousand square feet. So on a fertilizer bag, it's going to say put X pounds on per thousand square feet. Or grass seed, I'm going to tell you to put down four pounds of perennial ryegrass per thousand square feet. So you have to really know how many thousand square feet you have. So that's one little project you can do. 
Also, again, in this picture, I think about, you know, he's going to maybe want to have a really nice lawn in front of his house, but maybe he doesn't care so much about the backyard, okay? Or maybe he wants to have a nice lawn near his pool, but he doesn't care about the front lawn so much. So you don't have to have a perfect lawn everywhere, at least in my opinion, because this get, tends to get kind of expensive. And maybe you want to just work on certain areas or, or focus on certain places. Keeping, you know, an acre and a half in perfect lawn condition is going to be a lot of money. Okay. So what kind of grasses do we grow? I'll touch briefly on these, but it's important to know a little bit about these. There's basically four types that we grow mostly here in this part of the world. They're all called cool season grasses. And this is a little graph that shows that the cool season grasses like to grow in the spring and they like to grow in the fall. But they kind of take a little bit of a siesta if we have a hot June, July, and August period. That's when they kind of slow down naturally. And that's going to dictate how we work on our lawn. When do you think a lot of the lawn chores should be done? In the spring or the fall, right? Yeah, you know, when I get a chance to do it, right? <laughs> Typically, we don't want to do a lot of work on our lawn in July because our lawn doesn't really respond too well at that point. A lot of the jobs we're going to do on our lawn are best done in August and September, believe it or not. So we'll talk about why that is. Some things you can do in the spring as well. Okay, so just a minute on each of these grasses. <clears throat> Kentucky bluegrass. Now, this is a picture of when I went to Michigan State a few years ago. That's a bunch of people looking real excited about turf grass, isn't it? <laughs> they are at a turf grass variety trial, and we are, I should say, and we are real excited about those different varieties on the ground there with the strings. So Kentucky bluegrass, why do we grow that? Well, it has a uh, good color, uh, medium to fine texture, very attractive dark green grass, and it also has rhizomes, spreading roots that help it recover and fill in the bare patches. So Kentucky bluegrass will fill in the bare spots when maybe you have some insect damage or snowplow damage. It will tend to spread a little bit better than the other grasses. Uh, bluegrass tends to like good fertility. It wants to have some fertilizer to grow its best. And one of the drawbacks of it is it takes a long time to germinate from seed. Now, how long does Kentucky bluegrass take to germinate from seed? Anybody know? How many weeks? Weeks. Three, four weeks. It's very pokey to get started. Okay, so if you put uh, Kentucky bluegrass seed down, you're not going to have a whole lot for the first three, four weeks, and maybe even just a couple months. It really takes a long time to get going. And what happens in that time period? The birds come and eat it and the weeds grow. You guys know what happens, right? So it's a hard grass to get established, not necessarily very easy, okay? But it is a very nice and desirable grass. Perennial ryegrass is a bunch type grass. It doesn't spread, has a medium uh, texture and color, likes the sun the best, doesn't tolerate, tolerate drought as well as some of the others. It has something called endophyte sometime, which we'll talk a little bit about later, but that's a good thing. It's a good fungus. This takes, uh, it doesn't take much time to germinate and establish. How long does this take? Does anybody know? Three to seven days. Okay, this is the magic grass. You can put this down, water a little bit, and if the conditions are good, this will come up really fast. So I like to say if you're going to fix snowplow damage, you're going to try to outcompete the weeds, this is the grass you want to plant because it's going to fill in and really take, take a hold. Okay, so I really like perennial ryegrass for quick fixes. Fine fescue, okay. There's a bunch of different species that we call fine fescue. And these are very fine bladed grass. They're not very tolerant of wear, but they do have some good attributes. They take poor soil, low fertility, and can thrive in sun or shade, all right? So if you want to grow a grass in a shady place, look for fine fescue grass because that's typically the most shade tolerant type of grass. And it also grows the slowest. So if you want a low mow lawn or a lawn you don't have to mow very often, this is the kind of grass you want to get. And that's become a really um, thing of interest to people nowadays is planting these fine fescue lawns that require less mowing because we all know running lawnmowers isn't really good for the environment, and in a lot of ways, it's not a good thing. So less mowing you could have with fine fescue grass, and there's been a movement uh, in using this in low-maintenance lawns. 
Okay, this was a little plot that we planted of this low mo fescue. You can buy some of these mixes in different places, and it kind of looks clumpy. It doesn't look like a perfectly brilliant green, evenly tended lawn, but you might only have to mow that a few times a year because it grows so slowly, if you don't mind a bit of a shaggy look. So that's kind of a different way to have a lawn. Then there's tall fescue, which is kind of an interesting one. It was a weed, or it still is a weed, but they've made uh, turf-type tall fescues. And they did that by making the grass blade narrower and making it darker green. And they really are very attractive grasses now. Now, why would you plant tall fescue? It tolerates drought, poor soil, and low fertility. So if you had a really rocky soil, maybe a sandy soil, soil that was kind of poor, you might think about planting tall fescue because it puts out a very big root system and it's very drought tolerant. Okay, It doesn't spread, so you might need to overseed it to fill it in. And um, typically, you'd only mix this with a little bluegrass. It doesn't always mix well with other grasses. It takes about two weeks to germinate. There's one you should avoid called Kentucky 31 tall fescue. Okay. It's not a very attractive grass. It's light green, kind of open character, and it's a very old variety. So don't, don't buy that one. This is going to be on TV, and I'm going to get myself in trouble, but avoid that one. It's not really a very good improved grass. Okay, so you can go online and see these recommendations. This is kind of Cornell's guidelines about what you would plant where. A lot of times in the top part of that box, we plant um, a lawn with a fair amount of bluegrass in it, a little ryegrass and fescue. If we have a sunny area, we want to maybe fertilize it once or twice a year. Maybe we water it, okay? That's kind of the Cadillac type lawn. A lower maintenance lawn would be a lot of fine fescue in it or tall fescue, and a shady lawn would be more fine fescue, okay? But when you go to buy grass seed, you're going to see variations of this kind of same theme. Okay, now here's my friend Chris who used to work uh, in extension here in Schenectady County. And we're plowing up the library's lawn and blowing dust over here on the new car lot. <laughs> and why are we doing that? Because we're renovating that lawn 20 years ago when we were both more youthful. And we were doing this during the best time to seed a new lawn, August 15 to September 15. Okay? And why is that the best time to seed a new lawn? Because what doesn't happen as much? The weeds don't germinate as much, okay? If we go out now today and turn over soil, we give a green light to weeds germinating. They see that light come out, they get the warm temperature, all sorts of weeds, including crabgrass, really like to germinate. This time of the year, this August 15 to September 15, much less weed pressure, okay? So if you really want to avoid using herbicides in that way, Try to do your lawn renovation at that point because you'll have less weed competition, okay? You have to cancel your trip to the Hamptons or Martha's <laughs> Vineyard. It's, I know it's the best time of the year to travel, but uh, there you go. Okay, now something that you might use when you're going to grow new grass is a starter fertilizer. That can be a good way to fertilize a new lawn, and that typically has phosphorus in it. I'm not used to doing two hands here which has, is that middle number. This is a 20, 27, five. Things have changed a little bit, but that's basically what you're gonna see on a starter fertilizer. So you're allowed to use that phosphorus fertilizer in New York to start a new lawn, but we'll talk about the lawn regulations in a bit. And you also have to really be careful about watering, okay? Because that new grass seed doesn't wanna get too swamped with water. It also doesn't wanna dry out too much. And this is really one of the things that help holds back people growing new grass, I think. It's really tricky to have the weather cooperate, not too much rain, not too dry, that sort of thing. Okay, last fall I was doing a lot of overseeding, which I'll show you in a minute. And what did last fall do? It rained constantly, right? And a lot of my seed just rotted because it was too much rain, all right? And it, before that, in May and June last spring, it was extremely dry. So this is often where people get mixed up or messed up is the water, okay? There's also aids to germination. There's this paper mulch, which looks a little bit like rat poison, and you can put that out. It has a little bit of fertilizer in it and helps tamp down the soil and get the uh, seed to germinate. 
I like to use straw. Don't use hay because hay has what? Weed seeds in it, right? About one bale per thousand square feet, a little bit less maybe. And then there's this germination mat, which you can grow some nice grass under that as well. Okay, and those things tend to hold in the moisture, give the seed a little protection, and you get some better germination. Now, uh, seed is just like anything else in life. The more you spend on it, the better quality you get usually, okay? You cheap out on the grass seed, you probably get kind of, I would say, less desirable grass seed. I'll tone down my comments for the TV here. Okay, there's a thing called the chinch bug. And if you buy really cheap quality seed, you may have seed that's more susceptible to chinch bugs, okay? Or you might have seed that's more susceptible to diseases like rust. And what you want to look for with the chinch bug is this grass seed called endophyte enhanced because that's a natural fungus that lives in the grass plant and is a good guy and discourages the chinch bugs. And I'll show you pictures, more pictures of the chinch bug as we go. Sod is always a good option if you can afford it, right? Because sod tends to be very expensive, but it can give you an instant lawn. I like to tell people maybe you don't have to put sod everywhere, but if you have a smaller area, you can use sod very effectively. Um, it's grown um, here in the Capital District. This is some pictures from the sod farm up north. And you have an instant lawn, but of course you do have to do some soil preparation. You don't want to lay sod on concrete. You have to mix up the soil a little bit, do a pH test, which we'll talk about in a minute, maybe provide a little fertilizer. So you got to do some preparation and then you could put your sod down and about two weeks later, you can have a cocktail party on that. You can walk on it almost immediately. You have to water it and take care of it, but sod can grow in very well. Now, most sod is going to be Kentucky bluegrass or a mixture of those, right? And uh, you want to ask what kind of grass it is when you buy the sod because you want to make sure you put it in the right place. A real sun adapted Kentucky bluegrass isn't going to do well in a very shady area. So uh, we wouldn't want to try to do that. And this is kind of a picture in that regard. Here's people have planted sod in a very shady, difficult area, and that's not going to really work too well. Okay, so you either want to try to get fine fescue sod, which may be very hard to find, or maybe find a, a better uh, plan for that very shaded area. Okay. Then there's two other grasses that we'll mention uh, very briefly. One's called annual ryegrass, and the other one is called zoysia grass, okay? Annual ryegrass, what word in this plant's name provides a clue? This would not make good lawn grass. Okay, you all laugh. Some of you must be gardeners, or maybe a lot of you are gardeners. Annuals do what in the fall? They die, right? So if you have a grass seed mix that has a lot of annual ryegrass in it, it's not going to come back the next year. You'll typically find this type of grass seed very cheap in the store, very inexpensive, and it's because it's not going to really be a long-term thing, okay? But if you have an area where you need to make a temporary patch or um, want a temporary lawn, sometimes annual ryegrass, you know, has its uses. The other one that I really kind of like is zoysia grass. Now, zoysia grass still today is not green, all right? So as your grass is these brown grasses here in these pictures, and it's a warm season grass. It has a very big root system, but it turns green very slowly in the spring and turns brown very quickly in the fall. So in this part of the world, zoysia grass will be brown a good part of the year, and that's why people don't like it. But it's very uh, drought tolerant. Whoops. It's very drought tolerant. It has a big root system. Um, in some ways, it's got some really good uses to it. And the way you start zoysia grass is with sprigs or plugs. So it's not really, really very common around here. But when you go home tonight and the next couple of weeks, look around. And if you see these bright straw colored lawns, you know those people have zoysia grass, which is kind of interesting. Okay, how about clover? Does anybody like clover? Okay, a lot of people like clover because it fixes some nitrogen. And it um, is good for the bees, right? And I'm a beekeeper, so I like uh, clover for that aspect of it. Um, other people don't like clover because it attracts bees and you can have bee stings. And um, sometimes it looks kind of patchy in a lawn. But, um, you know, I think clover is up to you, really. Clover has definitely some benefits to it. It's getting kind of a new look nowadays because we're having uh, people develop micro clover, which stays shorter. 
and can also kind of be part of an environmental lawn. There's been some experimentation down at University of Maryland planting tall fescue and clover lawns. So we're going to see how that works out. So clover, it could be good. It could be bad. It depends on what you, what you want. All right. It's still America, right? You get to make choices. All right. Do we have to have lawns everywhere? Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm not that crazy. Uh, you know, sometimes alternative ground covers are good. Uh, shade is a very difficult place to have a lawn. I'm going to set this down for a second. Okay. Uh, shade. If I can't grow my fine fescue in the shade, what am I going to do? I'm going to plant a ground cover, right? I'm going to plant pachysandra, hostas. I'm going to get into a shade garden, right? Or maybe I'm going to let the moss grow and I'm going to edge it and I'm going to have a moss garden, which is very in and very trendy, right? <laughs> or if I can't grow anything in the shade under my Norway maple, I'm going to put down what? Don't say asphalt. Mulch, right? You can just mulch it and make it look nice and neat. Okay, because a lot of places under these big trees, there's not a lot of nutrients, there's not a lot of light, there's not a lot of moisture, and grass is just not going to grow very well. Okay, so sometimes we don't want to have grass in those kind of places. All right, uh, maintaining lawns. Now, we'll talk very briefly about soil. Sometimes you have very difficult soils to work with. Sometimes the topsoil has been scraped off and sold down the road, right? We have compacted soil. There's lots of challenges here. Okay. And this is a picture of a new house being built. And we're going to have a lot of compaction here. And compaction is when you have a clay soil, especially. There's been a lot of traffic on it. Cars, trucks, people walking, um, all sorts of things like that. And the soil just gets very hard. It doesn't have a lot of oxygen in it and becomes very dense. And turf grass and most plants don't really want to grow in a situation like that. Here's not a great picture, whoops, of an arbor. All the foot traffic's under that arbor, and then the grass kind of wears out. So what can we do about compaction? Well, um, we can test for it. Now, one thing I brought with me tonight, and I don't expect any of you to go buy one of these, but I just want to show you, it, is this little gizmo. If you're really into lawns, maybe you want to buy one of these. Anybody ever seen one of these? Well, it's a core sampler, okay? Or it also is good for the Easter blessing, right? <laughs> uh, no disrespect intended. Um, but you can go out and push this down in the ground. And if I can't push that down, what's the problem? It's compacted, right? In Rensselaer County, people would say, well, you hit a rock, right? <laughs> Over here, I don't think you have quite as many rocks maybe, but the soil is either compacted or very rocky if I can't push this down. But if I can push this down, I can get a profile of my soil and see if I have lower layers of maybe clay that's going to make this lawn poorly drained. Or maybe I have sand underneath that's going to improve my drainage. So it's kind of a nifty tool. If anybody here is in the landscape industry or goes out and looks at lawns for people, I always say buy one of those because they really can give you a lot of good information. A soil probe. Soil probe. Okay. It's probably... You probably can get one of those for 40 or 50 bucks nowadays. And here's a picture of a sports field. And of course, all those people playing sports on that is going to really compact that soil. And you can see it's poorly drained there. But this is a picture from a home lawn. And even you can have compaction in a home lawn. Okay. Well, how do you get rid of compaction? One way we have to try to do that is called core cultivation. And people can do this with equipment. You can have somebody come in and do it for you, or you can rent equipment. And it will address uh, compaction and thatch and overseeding and some of those issues. Okay. This is one of my old, old pictures, which I still like a lot. And I always say, this is not the aftermath of the Westminster Kennel Club dog show. <laughs> sort of looks like it might be, but it's not. This is on a golf course and they're pulling cores of soil out. It's basically kind of a whole series of these things, pulling these cores out. And those holes are going to let more light air, nutrients, if we put a little fertilizer on there, down into that soil. And if you do this enough, several times, many times maybe, you're going to reduce your compaction. Okay? There's just a schematic of what that looks like, pulling those cores out. 
And in theory, at least, we're going to have better root growth because we're going to have more oxygen and more fertilizer going down there. Now, you can collect those cores or you can break them up. And these are just some pictures of some of the home rental units you can get to try to do this yourself. Or you can have somebody come in with a bigger unit of some sort. How about the spikes on the shoes? Right. I always think that, you know, retired men need to have these <laughs> because they always have a lot of time on their hands. Um, I'll talk about that more. You know, it's not as crazy as you might think. There probably is a way or a, a use for those. Um, but spiking, aerating, these are the kind of things we do. But if you don't have a lot of compaction, you might not need to do this. Okay? So think about how much compaction you have. And the other one that kind of messes people up is thatch. A lot of people think, oh my gosh, I have to dethatch my lawn. But do you have thatch? Okay, do you have thatch? That's my question. Unless you have a lot of Kentucky bluegrass or fine fescue and you really have a high maintenance lawn, your lawn may not have a lot of thatch in it. So you don't need to worry about this. You can worry about all the 457 other problems in your mind if you're like me, right? So thatch, I'll show you where to look for it. And the other thing I should say right now is grass clippings don't make thatch. That was disproved decades ago. You can leave your grass clippings on the lawn. They just decompose nicely unless you have a lot of clumpy clippings, but they don't make thatch. Okay, so you don't have to pick up that grass. Now, what you want to do is go out in the lawn and take a slice down in the soil. Take a profile like you're cutting a brownie out of a cake pan, right? And you're going to look and see if you've got a lot of this kind of undecomposed organic matter here above the soil but below the green grass and that's going to be thatch okay so it's all this stuff right in here and if you have more than an inch of that then you need to worry about it but if you don't really find that you're not going to have to worry about dethatching your lawn okay forget about that and uh, does anybody play golf here Okay, a few people play golf. Have you ever gone on a golf course, especially like a putting green, and it feels bouncy? That's the thatch. So if your lawn feels bouncy, you probably have quite a bit of thatch. My lawn is called a weed test laboratory. Okay? <laughs> My lawn is not good enough to have thatch, all right? You have to have a pretty darn good lawn to have thatch. So maybe a lot of us don't have to worry about it. Okay. And core cultivation is the best way to do that, or a dethatching machine, which I'll show you in a second. They do have liquid dethatching products, which don't really typically work too well, so I would avoid those. All right, and there's an old picture of a dethatching machine that could be used to rip the thatch out if you had quite a bit of that. Now, when is the best time to do that? I'm going to be ripping this thatch out and making a lot of compostable material, right? Do I want to do that in the July heat? Spring, or better yet, that magical time, right? Because you're going to have less weeds come up. Okay, if we do this now, we're going to actually stimulate some weeds to come up. We can still do it, but weeds are going to germinate less again in the later part of the season. And there's lots of different pieces of equipment you can buy to do this kind of a job. Okay, overseeding. Now, this is my favorite topic because I worked a lot on this myself. And if you want to have an organic lawn and use very few or no pesticides, this is what you want to work, pay attention to, okay? Overseeding is just putting more grass seed into, a den or into a, an existing lawn. You have a lawn that's maybe thin, it's got some bare spots in it, got some weeds in it. We're going to try to overseed it, put more grass seed in it, and just make it denser, okay? So what kind of grass seed do you think we'd want to use for that? Perennial ryegrass. Have you heard this talk before? Oh, it says that. Oh, wow. I thought, I thought I had a groupie. Okay. No groupies, but we're all learning, which is the most important thing. Perennial ryegrass germinates quickly. It's going to fill in. It's going to be the best grass to do for overseeding. All right? You can try to use your bluegrass or your uh, fescues. Tall fescue actually isn't too bad either with the work we've done on it, but Perennial ryegrass is going to be probably the most successful in overseeding. All right. So the idea here is that we're going to go out and just throw grass seed down on the ground. And we're going to do this at a rate of two to four pounds of perennial ryegrass per thousand square feet 
We're going to start sometime after Labor Day, and we're going to do it three or four times, maybe five times. We're going to just go out, put our seed in our drop spreader or a rotary spreader, go up and down, just throw grass seed down, throw grass seed down, okay? And whoops, this is the original pictures that convinced me that this was going to work. We had a study at the Averill Park High School football field, practice field. So the kids are out there practicing football, and we wanted to see if we could get more grass to grow on the ground when they're playing football, because if you fall on grass, it's better than falling on dirt, right? So we had these strips here, and we went out and threw grass seed down on these strips at different rates from uh, a little after Labor Day through the beginning of October. And the kids were playing football on here day after day after day. And you can see they wore out most of this area, except where I kept throwing the grass seed down. So I thought, pretty cool, David. You grew grass seed where the kids were playing football. And I went away. And then I came back the next July, and that's the same place. So those strips are still there of my rye grass. And what's all this light green grass here? Anybody want to guess? It's the number one nemesis of home lawns in New York State, crabgrass. So what did we do there? We outcompeted the crabgrass by putting more perennial ryegrass seed in the ground. So this is the crux, I think, to organic lawn care, is overseeding with perennial ryegrass. Now, in Labor Day, is the best time, is spring okay enough? Spring ain't great. Don't bother. Yeah, I really tell people, you know, they want to get started on this. I think the, the late summer and early fall is much better. It just works much better. I've tried to do it in the spring, and the, the results haven't been very good. So far this spring, grass seed is rotting. I've put grass seed out. Nothing's happening, right? So it's really tricky to do um, this time of the year. So wait and do that, because what's happening to crabgrass at the later part of the summer into the fall? You're laughing at my picture. What's that crabgrass doing? It's dying. Well, it's making seeds, but it's also dying, okay? So crabgrass dies in the fall, and if you're putting grass seed down, what's going to happen? The grass seed's moving in, and the crabgrass is going to get pushed out. So we're changing the ecology, I like to think, of the lawn, all right? These were two strips I did in 2017, and this is a picture in late October. This is a park in Troy. This is all crabgrass around here. These are two strips that we did, and we overseeded those several times. 2017 was a bone-dry fall, but we managed to get quite a bit of good grass here. That's perennial ryegrass in that strip, and this is tall fescue in that strip. So go out and throw down grass seed. It's not a chemical. It's not a pesticide. Throw down grass seed. So we're saying that Labor Day through October, that's four weeks. Well, you can kind of stretch it out. and temperature? Well, when a lot of this is up to your judgment, all right? If the end of August and September is really rainy, it's probably not going to work too good. And you're going to want to try to get some done in October. But if your October is nice and warm, you're going to have more luck with it in October. It's all up to Mother Nature. And, you know, grass seed likes a fair amount of water, but not flooding. So this fall, 2018, I don't think I have a picture in here of 2018. But 2018 was hard to get this to work. It worked, but not as good as 2017. So it's all up to the weather. Okay, here's two more strips here, and that's my grass. So try give this a try. On our website, we have a whole fact sheet about this. Yes, ma'am. So you have Kentucky bluegrass, and then you overseed it with the perennial ryegrass. Is that going to look weird? That should blend okay. That should blend okay. Yes, sir. I never water these plots because all of my work is done um, with the assumption that people don't have water, okay? If you had a very dry fall and you had irrigation, yeah, you'd be ahead. You could, you could do this better. Okay, mowing, all right? How boring is mowing, right? Everybody has to do mowing, but there's really some key things about mowing that are really important. This is one of them, okay? Crummy old diagram, but it's good information as mowing height decreases maintenance level increases okay the shorter you mow the grass what less what do you have less of under the ground roots all right so some people i know like to mow their lawn down to an inch inch and a half guess what 
your roots are going to be shorter and shorter and shorter. You got to mow higher, you have more roots down there. All right. Somehow a lot of people don't get that. But the higher you mow, the more root system you're going to have. And you want a lot of roots on there, right? For when the drought comes or the grubs come or the chinch bugs come. So we want to have our grass mown high. Probably if we can mow to three inches, that's a really good height. Um, I know a lot of guys, especially, I'll pick on the guys. They like to lower that thing down. And brrr, I don't know why. I mean, they like short hair. They like short grass. So raise it up a little bit. All right. We talked about leaving the clippings. And if you can do that, you're going to return one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. It's basically free fertilizer. So if you don't have to pick up your clippings, that's a great thing. It's putting the fertilizer back in the ground. It's keeping that stuff out of the waste stream. It's a really good thing. Okay. How about lawnmowers themselves? Now, when I was in fourth grade, I drew this picture here of a rotary lawnmower. You can see that's a good quality picture. And how does that rotary lawnmower work? How does that cut the grass? Kind of wax it off, right? It's not very kind. But we love our rotary lawnmower because it can go through rocks. It can go over dirt. We can run over things. My neighbor, this is on TV, he's not watching. He's cutting down for Scythia shrubs and getting rid of them. And he puts the branches down on the ground this morning and he's running his lawnmower over them. So he doesn't have to take it to the town uh, recycling center. I said, Gus, I'll put those in my truck and take them. Oh, he wants to run it over. Well, yeah, it's great. You can do that with a rotary lawnmower. It's not good for the machine. But, man, you can do anything with that machine, right? So it's not really kind to the grass, though, right? Because it has this rather harsh cutting action. What's the most kind lawnmower to our grass? The real mower, right? Because this cuts with a bed knife, which is straight and a curved blade, and it cuts the grass with a scissors-like action, okay? What's the problem with this mower? It doesn't have an engine. Now, as Americans, we are not really fond of things without an engine, okay? But if you have a small lawn, you have an urban garden, a small area, you can mow with one of these. This is the best thing you can do because it doesn't pollute. It has a very nice cut to it. It's very kind to the grass. Okay, but oftentimes it's not really practical on bigger, bigger areas. And another problem with rotary lawnmowers is this. Now, this is not a very good picture, but you can kind of see that lawn has got a very gray or brown cast to it. And if we look very closely at those grass blades, we see this sort of a thing going on. What's going on there? The blades are dull, right? We call this dull mower injury. So we have to sharpen our blade. A sharp mower blade increases the efficiency of a lawnmower 20 to 30%. Lawnmowers are typically very inefficient machines. They produce a lot of pollution. So if we can keep our blade sharp, our engine tuned up, that's going to be much better for the environment and use less uh, oil and gas and, and release uh, less pollutants. So really sharpen your blade at least once a year. Typically, uh, they'll say every 30 hours of use, maybe that's a good standard to go by every year if you can do it. It's a real important thing. And here's another study about mowing height, okay? Mowing height matters, how high we mow our grass. This was done by Michigan State University. Now, I went to Ohio State University. OH. OHIO, -O, right? Uh, so, you know, Michigan State, I'm a little reluctant to put this up there, but it is a good study, so we'll talk about it. They mowed their lawn at different heights and calculated how much crabgrass was in there by September. A lawn mowed at one inch was 96% crabgrass because the good lawn grass couldn't compete with it, right? Whereas if they mowed at three or four inches, we had 4% crabgrass. So raising the mowing height will influence the weed population and reduce some of these weeds like crabgrass. Leaf mulching, this is a big uh, concern in some municipalities. Um, in Skodak, they don't pick up the leaves, so they don't care. But we can mulch those into the lawn. Unless we have a really heavy leaf fall, it's okay to chop up the leaves and leave them lay on the lawn. That's perfectly fine. Okay, how about the future? Anybody have a robotic mower? All right, that's what's coming, right? We're not going to drive our cars anymore and... We're going to have these robots that mow our lawn. So we'll be looking forward to that, I think. Although, 
you know, everybody likes to mow lawns. I think they've underestimated that Americans really are into this. So I think that's going to be a big cultural shift. I'm not ready for it. I love to mow my lawn because I have a riding lawnmower. I like to get out there. Nobody bothers me, right? It's a wonderful hour or so of peace. Now, of course, equal time, the ladies also like to mow as well. Okay, so lime. Do you need to add lime to your soil? All right. If we go to some home garden centers this time of the year, they'll have a sign up. I remember seeing one of these, and I quote, the average lawn in Rensselaer County needs X pounds of lime per year. Do you think I like that statement? No, right? Because how do you know? You don't know how much lime your lawn needs. You have to do a soil pH test, all right? We at Cooperative Extension can do that for you for a buck or two. It will tell you if you need to add lime or not. In Rensselaer County, a lot of our soils are naturally very high. They're very alkaline. And if you put lime on an alkaline soil, what are you going to do? You're making it more alkaline. So that's exactly what you don't want to do. So any kind of blanket recommendation is really bad. We have to do a soil test, right? So you can take it a sample to a garden center, cooperative extension. Here in Schenectady County, they're on Knott Street. There's a wonderful lady there named Angie. She's a very good friend of mine, Angie Tompkins. I want everybody in the room tomorrow to go to Angie's office. <laughs> She'll hate me, right? But she was out. Oh, Angie. Well, she's gonna, she better be prepared for tomorrow, right? Or you can even buy a little pH uh, kit from us and do millions of tests if you like to do that. So it's important for gardens. We really don't want to add too much lime. That's what really I think is uh, one of the messages there. How about fertilizer? Now we should do a soil test or we could do a soil test. We should know our area. We want to use our proper setting for our spreader. That's real important. We don't want to get uh, fertilizer on impervious or paved surfaces because what happens when it rains? It goes right down into the storm sewer, which is really bad. Okay. Make sure you calibrate your spreader. All right. I've bought a lot of these spreaders over the years. If you take one out of the box, oftentimes it doesn't really work exactly right. So on my website, there's a whole fact sheet about how to calibrate a spreader. It's a great project for a Saturday morning, right? Um, make sure you're putting out the right amount of fertilizer uh, and not too much. Of course, our fertilizer has three numbers on it, N, P, and K. Um, so that's something to look for on your fertilizer bag. And yeah, you have a question about that one? No, I just Oh, that's just an example there. We have a fairly new law in New York. It's actually not that new anymore, 2012, but I still like to talk about it. It's called the phosphorus law, kind of for short, and it says no phosphorus should be applied on a lawn unless you are establishing a new lawn or a soil test indicates the need for phosphorus. What's been happening is we've had too much runoff into bodies of water, and when that runoff goes into the water, we have a lot of algae, weeds, things grow, and that's not good as far as water pollution goes. So this law tries to reduce the amount of phosphorus that's put on lawns, which is a good thing. So if you want to do a soil test and find out how much phosphorus is in your lawn, that's a good thing. You can still use starter fertilizer that has phosphorus in it. Um, it also wants you to clean up spills. It also wants you to keep away from surface water with lawn applications. Keep away 20 feet. I don't know about rent, uh, Schenectady County so much, but... In Rensselaer County, a lot of people have little ponds in the, on their land, and they tend to mow right up to the pond. Is that a good practice? If you blow grass clippings into your pond, what are you doing? You're putting nutrients right in the water, all right? So stay away from the edge of the water with your fertilizer. Even if you, don't, if you cannot mow there every week, that would be good. That's called a buffer strip. Leave an un mowed area around a pond. That will help reduce water pollution as well. So who's enforcing this? <laughs> Judge Judy. Maybe she's watching. I don't know. But Judge Judy says, you know, you got to comply with this law. And it really is a good law because it does a lot of good things for us. Um, and it prohibits the application of lawn fertilizer between December 1 and April 1. And on our website is a summary of that. Okay. So as a result, a lot of lawn fertilizers now have zero phosphorus. So they've kind of worked on that and taking the phosphorus out for you. So you don't have to worry about that too much, really. Um, but read the label when you buy the, the uh, fertilizer. If you want to test for nutrients, we use the UMass Soil Testing Lab over in Amherst. 
and it will test for pH, phosphorus, potassium, a lot of micronutrients, organic matter, and gives you a fertility uh, recommendation for three crops. So you could test your soil for your vegetable garden, your flower garden, excuse me, and your lawn all in one test. And it costs, uh, it's gone up, it costs us about $30 now. But it's a good investment if you really don't know a lot about your soil. Or if you move to a new house or have a new property, you might want to take advantage of that. Uh, just a couple other things about fertilizer. There's a uh, quick release and slow release fertilizer. Typically, lawn uh, applications put down one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. If you read the label on most bags, it's going to tell you that, whether it's organic or inorganic fertilizer. So I would follow those rules pretty closely to put down the right exact amount and you'll probably have no problems. Now, when is the most important time to fertilize your lawn? Trick question, right? I've, I've beaten you into submission here. That's not good. I hope I'm not that scary. This is called Cornell's Home Lawn Program. I like to say that whenever you have a day off, you have to fertilize your lawn. Okay, thanks Cornell. Because if we fertilize our lawn just one time a year, we would want to do it around Labor Day. Okay? Labor Day is a good time to fertilize the lawn because it's gone through the summer. You give it a little fertility. There's a lot of root growth that happens in the fall. And then it's going to be ready for the winter. If you want to fertilize twice, it's usually Memorial Day and Labor Day. Three times it's Memorial Day, Labor Day, and around Halloween. Although that's kind of getting... People are kind of questioning that late fall fertilization. So I would say the most important one is this Labor Day time period. And if you want to do it twice, you might think about the Memorial Day. Now, do lawns really need a lot of fertilizer early in the spring? The unfertilized ones are just as green as the fertilized ones. A lot of lawns just grow really well in the spring. And if we put a lot of fertilizer on in the spring, it tends to increase the diseases that we get later. And it also tends to uh, push a lot of growth that we don't necessarily need. And quite honestly, a lot of lawns don't need a lot of fertilizer. If your lawn is 10, 15 years old, it may only need one fertilization a year. See if you can cut back a little bit and see what your results are. Because I think we've been over fertilizing things for a long time. So think about how, you, how much of that you're doing. All right, now we're going to wrap up with some pests, which... Oddly enough, are my favorite part of all this. I love to see disasters for some reason, right? You know, some people like disaster movies. I get excited when I see disasters in horticulture. Okay, so we have lawn weeds. They can be grassy or broadleaf weeds, and they can be annuals, biennials, or perennials. What's an annual weed life cycle? Okay, one year, it starts to grow in the spring usually, right? grows through the summer and then it sets seed, it fla or flowers and it sets seed, I should say, and it dies by the fall time. A biennial, how does that work? Takes a year off? Yeah. Goes to Las Vegas? No. It grows the first year but doesn't flower. Then it comes back the second year and it flowers, sets seed, and dies in the second year. There's not a lot of biennials, but there's some plants that do that. One weed in particular, not necessarily in lawns, is called garlic mustard. Anybody ever learn that one? Oh, people, yeah, that, that's a biennial, right? Perennial weeds just live forever and ever and ever, right? And they flower and they spread. And a lot of our lawn weeds are that kind of growth cycle as well. So how can we get rid of lawn weeds? Well, don't forget the overseeding, because to me, that's the most important way to get rid of some of the weeds that are annuals, like the crabgrass. That won't do so much good for the perennials um, as much as we would like. But there's a few other methods here. Uh, we have weed tools, right? We can go out and dig up our weeds. And in the very olden times, they would hire young boys and old men and send them out with these tools, and that was how they did lawn care. Okay? Nowadays, neither of those groups want to work very much. Okay? So that's kind of gone out. But if you have a very small lawn, you can still do that with some of these pointy tools. You can dig out your lawn weeds if you have a very small area. How about the blowtorch, the flame, right? Be careful with that, okay? It's not necessarily the best thing to use on lawns because we can leave big bare spots, right? That could get out of hand. 
we have different herbicides. And actually, we have some new herbicides, which I'm going to tell you about, which are kind of exciting in this area. But again, cultural things are important. Raise the mowing height, do the overseeing, that sort of thing. How about the spring raking? A few weeks ago, people were out raking their lawn very vigorously. Is that a good practice? What does raking do? Pulls up the dead, you know, we haven't done anything for months. We've been watching cable TV too much. So we're excited to get out there, but it also stirs up the weed seeds. Okay. So why do we rake? I think because we're bored. Broadleaf plantain. I'm going to show you that weed in a minute. It stays viable as a seed for 60 years in the soil. It needs light to germinate. So somebody that owned your house 59 years ago, let a broadleaf plantain go to seed. The seed went down in the soil and it was covered over and it didn't get exposed to light so it didn't germinate. You go out and rake it this year, you expose it to the light and you made a new weed. So think twice about raking your lawn, okay? It does it really need that? You know, raking leaves is one thing, but scratching up that soil, that's exposing more weed seeds to the green light of germination, all right? And there's our broadleaf plantain. It's not a very attractive weed. Okay, so want to get rid of your weeds. How many weeds can you tolerate? ID your weeds. If you have a strange weed, bring it to Angie. Send me a picture. We can help you identify that. Some weeds are really hard to get rid of, uh, such as annual bluegrass, quack rats, orchard grass. Um, and usually herbicide, unfortunately, is one of the quickest and easy ways to do this. Uh, so how many weeds do you have? All of these are in my lawn. Okay, all of these are on my weed test area. The dandelion, of course, isn't really that bad because we can get rid of those fairly easily. But the broadleaf plantain and the ground ivy are two of the toughest ones, right? So how can we manage these? Well, I'm going to tell you the traditional way that's been done was with an herbicide called 2,4-D. This has been an herbicide that's been around a very, very long time, and it's called selective. This will kill the weeds for the most part, but leave the grass alone. And this is a big industry. A lot of people use this kind of stuff on their lawn in the spring or the fall. And sometimes it's mixed with other herbicides that kind of make it work a little bit better. So this is a very common thing that people do, and it's a very widespread practice. But timing is really important for killing the weed. Now, if you want to kill dandelions, typically a good time to spray those is now in the spring because they kind of do what? They kind of disappear, right? They're not prevalent all through the season. But something like that ground ivy, that's really tough. And a tough weed probably is better sprayed in the fall. Okay, So if you're going to use this kind of material, I would like you to use it at the best time. If you've got um, ground ivy or plantain, the fall is a better time to spray it. Okay, Late summer into fall. And why do you think that is? What's a weed doing in the fall? It's storing energy, exactly. And how does it do that? It takes all its chemicals and its leaves and makes it go down into the roots. All right. So if you spray a weed in the fall, what's it going to do? It's going to take the herbicide down to the roots and it's going to kill it much better than spraying it in the spring. Because what's the weed doing in the spring? It's going, oh, right? It's coming up. All the energy is going up. So the herbicide's not going to work too well in the spring, for the most part, all right? So think about the timing. And there's our friend ground ivy. It's a creeping uh, stoloniferous plant and probably the number one plant that we get a lot of questions about, the number one weed. Charlie? Creeping Charlie, gill over the ground, has lots of names. Okay. Yep, little purple flower. It's actually kind of pretty when it flowers. has a very distinctive odor. If you could get used to this, why not just keep it, right? I've had people that kind of edge it and make a big landscape planting of this. There's nothing wrong with that. I was in California one time, and they were selling this in hanging baskets at a nursery. <laughs> so depending on where you are in the world, it may be an ornamental. Now, in a couple other places in the world, um, in Canada especially, they've banned the use of 2,4-D, okay? And as a result, the industry has come up with something called the iron herbicides. And this is kind of interesting for us now because you can find this in New York. 
And the thing here to think about is that weeds, some of them tend to be very sensitive to just the element iron, whereas grasses can tolerate iron. If you put iron on grass, it turns it a darker green and the grass says, thank you very much, I like that. Whereas if you spray some of these weeds, and there's a list up here, with iron, you can actually kill them or at least knock them back. So what's been developed is iron herbicide. And there's a couple brands of this, and I just put this up as an example. One's called Fiesta, and it's kind of a party for your lawn, right? Here's a weedy area with a lot of dandelion in it, and it's sprayed with this liquid iron and you get rid of quite a few of the weeds here. All right. Why is 2,4-D banned? Yeah. Uh, Cause in Canada, they think there's more environmental concerns about it. So, you know, and different groups were very concerned about that and they decided that they didn't want to have it anymore. It's not banned entirely. It's banned on uh, like home lawns. So I think they can use it in other places in Canada. Um, so we sprayed um, these iron herbicides on different weeds and uh, we got good control of some things like even the clover. If you don't like the clover, the iron is a fairly easy way to kill it. With the ground ivy, we sprayed it, I think it was twice, three weeks apart, and that knocked the ground ivy back pretty well. The broadleaf planting was a little more difficult to control with the iron, okay? Um, I think we needed three applications for that. So it's kind of an interesting product. It's got a very low environmental impact. Um, you know, there's a lot of iron in the environment, so you're really not adding a toxic product to the environment. And it's got a lot of good uh, credibility in that sense. Now, here's my weedy lawn I'm showing you pictures of. Here's a weedy patch of my lawn. We sprayed it on June 8 and June 21 with the iron herbicide. And by July 12th, we had a lot less weeds. We didn't have no weeds but we had a lot less weeds. So if you have concerns about the 2,4-D, you might try to use the iron herbicide and see how well that works for you. Still hasn't really been widely accepted, and I think uh, we have a lot more to learn about that. Okay, now what's this one? That's not a weed, right? For Scythia, why do we grow that? It makes us happy, right? When it flowers, it says, winter is over, right? but it's also a crabgrass pre-emergent herbicide indicator plant, all right? If you're gonna put on an herbicide on your, cra on your lawn to crowd out the crabgrass or control the crabgrass, when this blooms and starts to fade, that's when you would put that on, okay? So if you're not doing the overseeding, you can do this crabgrass preventer, and this is kind of the way that a lot of people have done this sort of thing, although I'm really pushing the overseeding because I think that's a really good way to do it. But when the forsythia blooms, it's time to put on your pre-emergent crabgrass product because the crabgrass is an annual and it will make a lot of seeds and it germinates after that forsythia is done blooming. So that crabgrass preventer, preventer chemical keeps the crabgrass out, okay? And there's a newly seeded patch with crabgrass coming into it. Now, the question here is, can we use pre-emergent herbicide on a newly seeded patch or an entire lawn of newly seeded area. Because what would the pre-emergent herbicide do to our seed? It would kill it, right? Well, there was one product called Sigeron or 2% that we had for a long time that you could use on a newly seeded lawn. The trouble is it didn't work too good. Now we have this one called Mesotrione, and that's safe on newly seeded lawns. And it's also becoming more widely used as a pre-emergent herbicide. And that's kind of an interesting one, too, because mesotrione is sold as tenacity. You might see it mixed with lawn fertilizer. And this is a newer, what's called a reduced-risk pesticide, okay? It doesn't have a lot of problems in the environment. It's got a relatively low toxicity. So this is kind of one that's a little more acceptable, I think, to, to using in a lawn. And it rapidly degrades by microorganisms. So you might see that out there. Um, it's being sold a little bit more. If you have concerns about some of the pre-emergent herbicide, you might want to try switching to this one. Okay? So uh, reduced risk herbicide uh, has low impact on human health, very low toxicity, low potential for groundwater contamination. You don't use a whole lot of it. Okay? So that's kind of new. Let's finish this up with a few pests. Okay? Here's what's killing my lawn. 
Okay, I'm going to pass this around. You can take a look at what's in that little jar there. Now, does anybody live in Voorheesville? I can tell the story then. Nobody's from Voorheesville? Does anybody have friends or relatives that live in Voorheesville? Does this television go to Voorheesville? Well, I shouldn't have said Voorheesville, but this was basically two neighbors that didn't get along too well. I'll, I won't tell you the whole story, but this neighbor was concerned about why this grass was dying. Okay, so he brought us a sample and he was concerned that his neighbor was killing the lawn. But what his neighbor wasn't killing the lawn, it was this guy. Okay, this is a, called a chinch bug. And these are very, very small. They're 3 sixteenths of an inch. They're little bugs, okay? And they have piercing, sucking mouth parts, okay? Whenever you hear something referred to as a true bug, it means it has piercing, sucking mouth parts. It sucks the juice out of the plant. So I like to say true bugs suck, okay? <laughs> and they start out red, then they turn gray, then they turn black with white wings. And again, this guy is only 3 sixteenths of an inch long, so he's very, very small. He likes hot, dry weather, and he develops uh, by incomplete metamorphosis, which I won't bore you with. There's about two generations per year, and the female can lay up to 300 eggs. So you can see that if you have a lot of these little guys, they can build up a big population, and by August, September, and into October, you can have some serious lawn damage. Now here again, we're in Voorheesville, which I guess is the center of all lawn problems. And I went to see this lawn for a friend of mine, and these were all areas that were damaged by the chinch bugs. Okay? You won't see them now. You're not going to see them at all. And when you see the vial, you're going to see that it's hard to see them even if they're there because they're just so tiny. So a lot of people don't know why this is dying. It looks like drought damage because they can't see the chinch bugs. They're really hard to uh, notice. They feed on all different types of grasses. And starting in July, you can start to see the damage. But a lot of times, it's really into August and September where they look pretty bad. Now, this is called a chinch bug detection device. Okay, this was developed by the U.S. government. It cost $25 million. <laughs> so it's a very serious tool. What you're going to do with that chinch bug detection device is go out in your lawn, shimmy that down where there's green grass and brown grass kind of on the edge of the damage, Put water in there, and what's going to happen to the chinch bugs? They're going to float to the surface. It's called flotation, a flotation device. Or you can go out to your lawn, cut a little square out of it, put it in a bucket, and see if the chinch bugs float up to the surface, right? And maybe if you're not as blind as I am, you can kind of see those little bugs jumping around on there. So chinch bugs can be managed with insecticides, but a lot of times that endophytic grass is the way to go, okay? That picture, those pictures in Voorheesville, we told the homeowners to go out and seek out endophytic varieties of grasses because the endophyte is a naturally occurring fungus that lives in the grass plant. It's a good fungus, believe it or not, and it makes the grass plant unfavorable or untasty to the chinch bug. So it's gonna thwart the chinch bugs naturally and we call that biological control. It's a pretty cool system. So if you had a lot of endophytic grasses in your lawn, they may withstand the chinch bugs and you wouldn't have to spray your lawn for them, okay? There are insecticides you can use if you have to. What time would you use that uh, detector? Uh, when you started to see the browning. So that would be probably August, I would think, into September. That picture, the last picture in Voorheesville, I think I took that in the beginning of October. So sometimes it doesn't really show up until quite a bit later. And this is our other pest uh, of large magnitude in our area. These are grubs, and they've eaten all these different lawns here. Here, these pictures, uh, other animals have come in, and they're eating the grubs. So you can have a lot of wildlife happening on your lawn when you have grubs. And these are new pictures I took just a, a week ago, I guess, uh, last week. And this is in Troy, and this is all grub damage here. Okay, very nice house, and the poor homeowner has been wiped out by grubs. So if we go out and we rake our lawn, maybe this time of the year, and we have no grass and it kind of comes up very easily, we might have all these little white guys in there, and those are the grubs. Okay, so here's a diagram of the grub, the life cycle. It starts out as an egg. It hatches into this little C-shaped guy. 
that has six legs on the front end and a brown head capsule. He grows through three what are called instars or life stages. Then he pupates and becomes an adult beetle. And this takes about a year to happen. Okay. Uh, there's a C-shaped grub. That's what they look like. I was out digging today, doing some weeding, and I was pulling these grubs up, and that's what I found. Now, does anybody like, oh, I shouldn't say this one because it's TV. Does anybody like red lobster? Okay, you ever have that popcorn shrimp? <laughs> Sorry, red lobster. Okay. This is a diagram I have of the grub life cycle over my bed. I look at it every night uh, because it's kind of a very important one. And why don't we start out here in May? The grubs are coming up to the surface of the ground, or higher up in the soil, I should say. They might feed for a very short time, but then they're going to pupate, which means a resting stage. They don't feed anymore. And then they become adult beetles. And those beetles fly around and maybe do some damage on ornamental plants, and maybe not, depending on the species. The females will lay eggs in August, and those new grubs will hatch and go about feeding. Primarily in this fall period is the worst time of the feeding. And then when the ground gets cold, they go down into the soil and stop their damage. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of these very briefly. Of course, everybody, everybody might know the Japanese beetle. It's a very attractive beetle, really, uh, kind of bronze and green, feeds within two inches of the surface. Um, there's a record count of 122 grubs per square foot that turned out to be Japanese beetles. All right. Now, how many grubs per square foot could your lawn tolerate without showing damage like in some of those pictures? How many grubs per square foot would you guess? Less than 10. Less than 10. I would say five to eight grubs per square foot. More than that, you're going to have some damage. That house in Troy, 40 grubs per square foot. Okay. The lawn is kind of seething with these things, right? Kind of creepy. Oriental beetles, we have some of these in Rensselaer County. You might have them too. They're kind of a dull sort of gray-brown color with two kind of markings up on the top part there. They do a fair amount of damage. But the worst one probably is called the European chafer because it does more feeding than either of the other two. It's larger than the Japanese beetle, and it's harder to kill with the grub control. All right? And that's a European chafer there. So in our area, the Capital District, we have all three of those species. We actually have a few more species, which I'm not going to show you. If you find a grub and you want to know what kind it is, and you're a science nerd like I am, go Google Grub ID Key Cornell. It's a new resource we have, and it will take you to a Cornell website. These pictures are stolen from that, and it will teach you how to identify what kind of grubs you have. Really cool science project. Uh, fun for all ages here. You're going to need a little hand lens like this dude here uh, is holding the grub, and you're going to look at the raster, which is the business end of the grub there. Look at the pattern of spines, and it's going to tell you if you have a Japanese beetle or a European chafer. Great thing to get kids off the screen, right? Off of Facebook. Look at grubs, okay? We have some biological indicators of grubs, right? If you have a lot of bird activity in your yard, a lot of mole activity, or boys with skunks, because all these, except the boy, like to eat grubs. So sometimes people call us and they say, I have a lot of birds pecking in my lawn, or I have a lot of uh, skunk damage or raccoon damage. That could be because you have a lot of grubs in your lawn. You can go out and look for grubs. This is what we were doing years ago on a golf course. Take a little slice out. This is what I did in Troy the other day and paw through that slice, and you're going to see the grubs in that, that surface, uh, or just below the surface in that sample. Okay, now there's a bunch of different grub controls. Okay, I won't talk about these in any great depth, but a couple of these, these two up here, are typically applied in June, and they'll control the grubs coming up for the next batch in the fall. The trichlorphon is the fast-acting grub killer, and that will kill the grubs within about two weeks. So if you're going to use these products, really read the label, um, learn about what they are. A lot of lawns have this applied to them when there's no grubs because people are too lazy to look for them. Or maybe they just want to put grub control down and they don't really know what they're doing. So I only recommend using this kind of stuff if you have a problem, if you know you have a problem, if you've had a history of a problem. 
I think there was a study done in Rochester years and years ago, and 80% of the lawns that were treated for grubs actually had no grubs. So we use a lot of this when we don't have to. So we could be a lot more careful with it, I think. There are a few biological controls for grubs. One of them you might have heard about is called nematodes. There's two types of nematodes listed here. Basically, nematodes are little eel-like creatures, okay? You buy these from a biological lab. You take these out and you spray them on your lawn in the evening because they don't like ultraviolet light. You have to water them in. And they go down into the soil and they look for the grubs. They enter either end of the grub, they go into the grub's stomach, regurgitate a bacteria, and they kill the grub, okay? Nematodes can actually work just as well, if not better, than the chemicals. But you have to really be good at applying these, and it's not an easy system to use. If you're really good at biology and you're kind of into this thing, you might be able to do it. But it's not typically uh, easy for the average homeowner to do it, and it's also typically costs quite a bit. Uh, $250 for 250 million of these, and you want to apply 250 million to 1 billion per acre. So they tend to be very expensive. It doesn't okay. take like two years for it to be effective? No, this will work very quickly. These would work in a week or two if they're going to work. But this hasn't caught on because it's not an easy system. Yes? No, these are good guys. There's good nematodes and there's bad nematodes too. Mm. But these are the good nematodes. Okay. But then there's, I think, a product that is very new, and this might really catch on. There's something called Bacillus thuringiensis variety galleriae, and it's called BT for short. Now, there's probably a few people here that are gardeners, and they might know the term BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. This is a beneficial bacteria that's been used for many, many years. And let's say you have cabbage worms on your broccoli or your cabbage. You could spray BT, and this is a beneficial bacteria that would kill those cabbage worms. Well, finally, we have developed a bacteria, Bacillus uh, thuringiensis, for grubs in the soil of lawns. So this is really big news, okay? Uh, it's a bacteria. The grub eats it. It acts as a stomach poison. They stop eating for hours, but they may not die for days. So there's been a lot of testing for this, and some of the really well-known entomologists have said, yeah, we think this thing is going to work. So it's very exciting because we might have an alternative to the chemical pesticides now for grubs. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Um, you probably would have to buy this on the internet at this point. So Google it and see if you can find it. I've seen it on there, and people are starting to use it. So it's kind of a neat system. When, when would you use that? I would probably put this on again in August would be about the time to do it. Um, if you have a grub population, that's going to be um, when you want to put it on there. Okay? Um, and then those spikes. Okay? Now, this is kind of a funny thing. There's an entomologist named Whitney Cranshaw at the University of Colorado in 1989 claimed that three-inch spike sandals controlled 56% of the grubs in a test plot, okay? So he put those on a graduate student, because, you know, <laughs> graduate students have to do all the dirty work, and they killed 56% of the grubs by using those spike sandals. Wow. By, spearing? by spearing them, right? <laughs> You're killing the grubs by your spike sandals, all right? Ben McGraw, who was a researcher at Delhi, killed up to 81% of the grubs using an aerating machine, okay? So we need a lot more studies on that sort of thing, but maybe there's other ways we can cook grubs uh, which are a little more innovative. So that's kind of coming up, and that could be kind of neat. So we covered a lot of stuff. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? What are your thoughts about controlling very sandy, shady soil Oh, the little, do you have bees for just the beginning of the season? Oh, they like to hang around. And if you, since you like bees, you're welcome to come over and take a few out of your home. Yeah. You know, there's, there's ground nesting bees, which are really important pollinators. And there's some species that only live in the spring and then they kind of go dormant. And uh, they're not so problematic. Mm, it's hard to control some of those things otherwise. Um, you know, you can use a lawn insecticide on them. But if they're the species that kind of go away, we really try to urge people to just leave those alone. Okay? What else? Yes? 
Fungus. We didn't talk about fungus. Mm. Well, there's a number of different fungi that will infect lawns. Um, probably the best thing you can do is send me a picture. Um, a lot of times there's certain fungi that live in the spring. One's called red thread. It has kind of a little red body on it. Um, typically, we used to say if you gave your lawn a little fertilizer, it would probably outgrow the red thread. So I don't know if you fertilize your lawn at all. It doesn't kill as much. Yeah. Red thread is actually, I think, we think is getting kind of worse in the spring. You know, there's fungicide you can use on that. We typically tell people if you can tolerate it, it's better than using the fungicide. But, um, you know, if you send me an email, I can send you a link about that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, can I jump in? Because I see people are trickling out, and uh, we didn't get to do an intro announcement, but the Nicotina Conservation Advisory Council is looking at ways for people to reduce their pesticides and their herbs and chemicals, and Mr. Chenery was a great part of that, and so the town is going to really thank him for coming and being so helpful and showing us ways that we may not even understand um, yet how to um, make our lives more beautiful. But um, we do have some of the members of the CAC here tonight, and I did put Alyssa, if you're interested in any initiatives that the CAC is working on to try and do less pesticides, less herbicides, but beautiful lawns, because yes, Cynthia loves their beautiful lawns. Um, if you just want to write your name and email, if something comes up, we can contact you, and no big deal if you just want to learn how to grow a great uh, lawn. And anyway, thank you very much, David. Oh, thank you. Okay, we'll just do one or two more questions and then you guys can go. Yes, sir. So uh, I have a lot of clay, uh, very little topsoil. Um, what I got out of this was aerate to the plugs or no, or just if you topsoil If or? it's really compacted, you might try aerating it, but you got to aerate a lot to really make a change. So you might think about if you're going to reseed that, growing something like tall fescue, which can tolerate that ground more. It's hard to change the soil. Um, you know, to change soil, you have to either bring in a lot of topsoil or a lot of compost. And sometimes you bring in a lot of weeds when you do that. So if you can kind of work with the soil you have at all, that's kind of my thought about that. I know there are some really heavy clay soils, and they can be kind of difficult. But the tall fescue has a best, the best root system. So... Yes, ma'am. I have uh, a lot of moss growing in a shady area, and I usually try and rake it out and reseed. But if I just leave the moss, will it spread to the sunny part of the lawn, or will it just stay? Oh, uh, well, the moss, yes, the moss likes to grow where the grass doesn't want to grow. So if you have grass or you have moss in the sunshine, we would say check your pH because it might be off. Um, if you want to increase the fertility, that might get the grass to outcompete the moss. You might have to overseed it. Uh, there are demossing products. They typically have iron in them because iron will kill the moss. Um, in a shady place, it may be that it's just too shady for the grass. But in a sunny place, you should be able to grow grass. So I would check the pH, check the uh, fertility, and maybe do some overseeding. So we'll do one more. Yes, sir. You know, part of the thing about organic lawn care is so is to so that you're not injuring birds or animals, sort of like with your application of chemicals. So, where do you go to get information like that? And the second half of the question: stuff like corn gluten. I didn't hear anything about that. Is that a, a still a viable treatment? The corn gluten. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the overseeding is one of the most important things. The mowing high is really important. Um, the proper fertility is important. Those are all kind of the organic things as well as the traditional things. Um, certainly the BT is kind of an organic slant. The Fiesta is not exactly organic, but it's kind of along those lines or the iron herbicide. Now, the corn gluten is interesting. Okay, is the TV still on? <laughs> Okay, corn gluten was developed by Iowa State University, and they were looking for alternative products or things to do with corn products. And the researcher there put that on 
a golf green, thinking that it would reduce fungus on that golf green. And they thought they could see that it reduced weeds. And then they marketed that and it became a very big thing. The controversy has always been that a lot of the other state universities can't duplicate those results. Okay, So corn gluten has fallen out of favor amongst the science community. It also adds a lot of nitrogen to the soil. It adds at least two pounds per thousand square feet or more. And remember, what was our recommendation? One pound. So you're putting a lot of fertilizer on. And the idea is that some people think it's just stimulating the grass to grow so darn fast that maybe it's crowding out the weeds. Whether there's a chemical in there that really is an herbicide of some sort, I think that's never really been fully answered. So corn gluten has kind of fallen out of favor. I think if I was going to spend money, I would spend money on grass seed. Okay? Because grass seed, you know, it's not exactly cheap, but it's easy to get. It's easy to put down. You don't have to worry about anything with it. Just throw down grass seed in the fall. Yes, sir. I had some grass seed in my backyard shed over the winter. It's cold in winter. Is that seed still viable? It should last for about a year to six, uh, 18 months, so it probably is okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, gosh, I was afraid somebody would ask about <laughs> nut sedge. Sorry. Nut sedge is really hard to manage. There's a couple specialty herbicides you have to use. And if you really want to use those, you have to use them, I think it's in the summertime. If you send me an email, I'll send you a link to that. There's really no easy way to get rid of nut sedge, the difficult weed. So, nut sedge. When we were looking for grass seeds, it seems like it always comes with blue stuff Mm. Yeah. Uh, there's a really good grass seed source, and we're not supposed to recommend sources, but if you want to find really good grass seed that's been screened for use in New York. You go to seedsuperstore.com. Yeah. Don't tell anybody I told you. Okay? There's a guy that owns that company in Buffalo, and he looked at the Cornell recommendations and tries to match the varieties to the Cornell recommendation. And you can buy just plain grass. There's also other retailers in the area, like the Sod Farm will sell grass seeds, um, some of the other stores. So you can you can find it, I think, if you look at it. But a lot of the big box stores are selling trees. So, okay. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 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 Yes.